In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the introit this morning, we heard these words, Lord, Thou hast been our refuge from generation to generation, from eternity and to eternity Thou art. Remember yesterday, we began our little discussion on the emotion of fear, distinguishing it from the fear of God, which is vertical, which is the beginning of wisdom. And remember that we started our little discussion, our meditation and our reflection, as it were, we were in Jerusalem, surrounded by Syrians, Assyrians, but we could even say Syrians. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Things did not look good for those living in Jerusalem. They were surrounded by over a 100,000 or more Syrians. And these men were boasting and speaking up, trying to increase the fear and the terror of those inside the city. We are going to take over. God's on our side. And so people inside the city of Jerusalem were filled with fear and wondering, if they could escape. And so in this discussion, we reflected on the scholastics. We learned that the emotion of fear, a very powerful emotion in man, rises up, moving him to run away from looming evil that seems to be escapable. That seems to be escapable. Now in the scriptures, the first time we hear of fear is in the Garden of Eden. Not surprising, that's where it began. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 3, And the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in paradise, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. This scene is very telling. Let's take note of the causes of Adam's fear, for it is the same in us too, because human nature doesn't really change, does it? First, it is sin that made Adam fearful. Sin removed the bridal, the inner harmony that kept fear under the control of reason. Sin made Adam try to hide or escape even from God. Let's face it, many Catholics today are living in sin. And not surprisingly, they run away from God and struggle with much anxiety. If we want fear to die down in our souls, we need to make good confessions and stop sinning. That's number one. Number two, the nakedness of Adam shows how fear rises up when sinful man is confronted with a power greater than himself. Thus, Adam's nakedness is not just lack of clothing, but the lack of any defense, supernatural or natural. He was, as it were, a city without walls, a soldier without armor and sword. In our time, the scriptures have been fulfilled with the raising of the church's defenses, or fences have been knocked down. In the Psalms, as well as in the prophet Isaiah, we hear about the hedges and the walls of the Lord's vineyard being knocked down. You can look it up in Isaiah chapter 5. It's also in the Psalms in various places. Why have you taken down the hedges? Why have you knocked down the walls, O Lord? I mention this because it's as it were today, the church is naked. As a result, Catholics are more and more persecuted worldwide. Think of it. Who defends our rights now? We're open to attack on nearly every front. And many forces seem to be gathering together, closing in for the kill. Thus, fear rises up in good Catholics at this time. We're like those in Jerusalem, surrounded by the Syrians. Third of all, fear results from some separation. We fear to lose things. Adam lost the gift of grace and he feared the loss of Eve. And he feared the loss of the garden. And ultimately, in the presence of the all-powerful God, he feared death, the separation of body and soul. 
Man naturally fears the loss of what he possesses. His home, his job, his family, his loved ones. Whatever he holds dear. So there's a certain self-preservation underlying fear, isn't there? It's one of the biggest motives of fear rising up. Self-preservation. It's one of the deepest instincts in man. And that's why that principle, he who is ready to die is ready to really live. Because once you've overcome that instinct of self-preservation by being open to death and ready to die, you're ready to do anything. Nothing will slow you down. He who is ready to die is ready to live. And fourth of all, pain causes fear. Pain. After sinning, Adam could feel pain with the loss of the preternatural gift of impassibility. The body does not like pain and lets the mind and heart know it. We pull away from excessive heat or cold. Catholics have stopped doing penance, haven't they? We've stopped living sacrificial lives, and now we're more afraid than ever of looming pain. We used to be very practiced in penance, and so we're not so afraid of suffering. And finally, for our meditation, we could also note how uncertainty causes fear. Adam surely feared both the uncertainty of God's reaction to his sin and the uncertainty of life outside the garden in a world now at enmity with him to some degree. Little children are often afraid of things because they lack experience in life. They do not have enough memory or memories to help them know what is possible and not possible. With the rise of evolution and the modern ways of thinking, many are uncertain about many things in the world. And thus, fear rises up. In fact, many of the modern leaders want us to be off balance. They want us to be uncertain. The communists were experts at keeping people in suspicion of each other and uncertain about things so they would be afraid and could be manipulated. So, in summary, we might notice that the causes of fear in Adam, that is, in fallen man in general, are both internal and external. Internally, they are caused by sin, the lack of grace and virtue in the soul, as well as a lack of memory, not having the proper memories or understanding of God's ways to conquer a present uncertainty. Externally, they're caused by our weakness or nakedness in the face of a stronger power, of looming pain, as well as forced detachment from things familiar. We don't like detaching from what we love. All these internal and external sources come together to disturb our minds and hearts. Once again, we repeat ourselves, the devil loves these fearful disturbances and seeks to stir them up as much as possible and even to exaggerate them as much as possible because he likes to fish in troubled waters. Fear is to the devil as honey is to bees. When we're afraid, he comes around to get us. Fear attracts him and he is expert at getting fearful people to do the dumbest things. Now this is symbolized by Goliath. Goliath is this huge man, a giant, and he has this incredible armor, and he's got a big mouth, and he's boasting, and he's willing to take anybody on. He seems to be impossible to take on. He seems very threatening and intimidating. And he carried a huge sword, the sword of fear, as it were. But how does the story end? It's very telling. The very sword of fear that he wielded turned on him by David. A youth nearly naked, carrying only five smooth stones, which stand for the five wounds of our Lord. And it only took one stone. And then he cut Goliath's head off 
with his own sword. The fear that he was wielding was turned and it cut off his head. That's symbolic. The fear the devil is wielding will be turned on him and he himself will be the one who flees in fear back to hell. So the lesson is clear. We have what it takes to turn the sword of fear back upon the devil and all those who cooperate and follow him. We have the Christ. We have the five wounds of Christ, which can remove all the fears that rise up and fall in Adam. Fears caused by sin, fears caused by uncertainty, pain, and death. Again, let us not run away and try to escape because the sources of the fear upon the world now that we may be feeling, they're inescapable. They're everywhere. Let's accept it and deal with it like that airplane pilot who's calm and clear-headed even as it seems everything is lost. He doesn't try to escape. He deals with it. So let's accept the passion of the church and work with her to bring the good that God has designated for us out of this time of trial. Let's remain calm and do our part. We'll take this up again tomorrow. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.